All right, every once in a while, there's some stuff that goes out there and makes you go, what in the heck are they thinking, right? So anyway, hey guys, it's Dr. Sean Baker. I want to talk about a recent stance taken by the American College of Physicians on what they consider targets for diabetics with regard to the hemoglobin A1C. And so they've recently raised the target for type 2 diabetics from having a hemoglobin A1C below 7%, which already is too high, to between 7 and 8%. I mean, this to me is absolutely almost criminal in my mind. So this video, we'll talk about what is an A1C, why is it important, what happens when it's too high, and we'll talk about some ways you might want to consider lowering your hemoglobin A1C, and then I'll give you my final thoughts at the end. So first, let's define what hemoglobin A1C is. Well, it is the amount of glycated hemoglobin that is in your blood. Now, it shows what percentage of your blood is saturated with with sugar. Now, it reflects your average plasma glucose control over the last two to three months when you get it tested. Now, if your hemoglobin A1C scores between four and 5.6, you're considered healthy. Now, these numbers are somewhat a little bit arbitrary, but that's generally accepted as what is considered a healthy range. Now, if it goes about 5.7 to about 6.4, you're considered to be pre-diabetic. And if you have it above 6.4, you're considered to be, frankly, diabetic. And so those with a hemoglobin A1C above 6.4 start to experience symptoms of diabetes to include blood vessel and heart damage, uh, which can result in heart disease, stroke, and further atherosclerosis, neuropathy, which happens when there are nerve damage in the limbs due to excessively high blood sugar. These results in tingling, burning, numbness, overall loss of feeling in your extremities, usually startling in your toes and fingers and moving up as the nerve damage progresses. Once the nerves have been damaged, it can result in needing to cut off fingers, toes, arms, and legs in order to stop progression of the nerve damage. You know, I've had to do that to many patients, cut off fingers, toes, and so on and so forth. It's not a fun situation. Blood glucose in these levels also can lead to chronic end-stage kidney disease, which usually is progressive due to the stress and strain caused by excessively high blood glucose and insulin resistance. It can lead to eye damage, things like cataracts, glaucoma, uh, blood vessel damage, which can lead ultimately to blindness. We have slowed healing of infections, getting more sick over extended periods of time due to lowered immune system from high blood glucose. Skin conditions like psoriasis, eczema, and other fungal or bacterial skin, skin diseases are exacerbated by this. Dementia due to plaque buildup in the brain being excessively high levels of blood glucose, which impairs uh, insulin signaling. And then also there's obstructive sleep apnea, which often comes as a result of uncontrolled weight accumulation due to high blood sugar and insulin. Unfortunately, simply raising the target hemoglobin A1C doesn't make these symptoms go away. They're still there. Let's talk about a few lifestyle changes you can make that not only lowers your hemoglobin A1C, but can also bring it back down into a normal non-diabetic range, which I think should be the goal for all diabetics, whether type 1 or type 2. First of all, remove all sources of sugar and start to carbohydrates from your diet. That should be a first-line thing that every single diabetic does. I don't care what the ADA says. This is probably the better thing to do. Now, if your hemoglobin A1C is about 5 Point six, that's a sign your body is to somewhat, to some extent, struggling to handle carbohydrates right now. So taking them out may prevent you from progressing on to full-blown diabetes. Now, don't be confused. Pre-diabetes is basically diabetes. It's just how, how diabetic are you? It's kind of like being partially pregnant. You either are or you're not. Take those things out right away to prevent progression, okay? We're trying to avoid these end-stage complications, which I talked about earlier. Remove hyper-processed foods, seed oils, and foods that contain them, which are typically the hyper-processed foods. And so seed oils are highly concentrated sources of omega-6 fats, which can directly damage arteries and gut, brain, and other cells. There's, there's significant evidence that suggests that is the case. Very controversial, but on the safe side, it probably helps to do that. Again, removing out these hyper-processed foods that contain inflammatory grains, dyes, sugars, food additives, and so on and so forth that both provide no nutrition and can certainly cause problems with our gut integrity, leading to inability to properly get nutrition in. They also can directly damage certain cells' metabolism centers, which could fundamentally lead to further metabolic impairment. Intermittent fasting, or at least it's not eat constantly. So intermittent fasting, when you have a specific time period in the day where you eat in longer stretches where you don't eat. Now, it might be twice a day, three times a day, once a day, something like that. But eating constantly clearly is a problem, particularly for diabetics, because you continually are you know, over-consuming most often. One of the most common intermittent fasting patterns is about 18 hours of fasting, followed by a six-hour eating, eating pattern, adding more fatty meat and low-carb vegetables and whole food animal-based products to the diet could 
could be very helpful for many people. Now, some of you guys may not want to include the vegetables. Fatty meats like animal food, beef, eggs, butter contain bioavailable nutrients and fats that can be easily converted to energy without the need for significant insulin uh, elevations. The protein in ruminants, poultry, fish, and, egg, and eggs help to rebuild structures in your body to include the cells involved in the metabolism. And, 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 and while they're not essential, <laughs> and I'll repeat that, they're not essential, but low-carb vegetables might have a place for some people from a, from a satiety sense and things like that. Movement, again, just moving your body. The absence of sedentary behavior, I think that is the most important thing. Even more so than just focus exercise, just stop being sedentary, okay? Getting out and using your body, and then as you feel better, you know, maybe progressing to exercise would be a great way to do it. Cardio or strength training, the best thing to do is something you're gonna actually do, right? Don't worry about whatever you think you'd actually do. Now, they both have their advantages. I certainly think that strength training is, is extremely important for a number of reasons. Uh, but cardiovascular exercise can be as helpful as well, but at the very least, stop being sedentary. That'll help you out tremendously. Now, lower your overall stress level. Now, some things are unavoidable. Obviously, things happen in our life, but if we have a good way of managing and coping with that, whether it's walking, meditation, breathing, techniques, uh, light exercise, things like that, uh, that can certainly help us to lower the stress. We know that high elevated stress levels drive glucose levels up through things like cortisol. So those things can definitely help you to do that. Okay, so final thoughts on this. You know, it is extremely sad that we are accepting and normalizing pathology in this country. And so the answer is, well, don't, don't try to focus on lowering this let's just take another pill. And we see this with obesity, we see this with mental health disorder, we see this with autoimmune disease. We're accepting this and normalizing all these things and it's not normal. We should not be a sick population. We should not be having all these diseases. And the problem is, is the food system. And don't rely on the government or the corporation to change the food system. You've got to change your own food system if you want to get this to work. So change the food, you know, largely you can avoid all of the, you know, the, the problems that come with our I won't even call it a healthcare system, a sick care system. All right, this is Dr. Baker. Let me know what you guys think. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. We'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.